Boy in the Alamo, chapter three. I joined the volunteers. We went into the log cabin. Colonel Gray said I should wash my face and then have breakfast. I went to wash and I figure he took up my case with Mr. Murphy, the driver of the stage. You can't leave the lad here, he was saying when I came back. I've got no call to feel responsible about him, Mr. Murphy said. I don't want to get in trouble with my employers. I have no truck with runaway young'uns or slaves. That's my orders. It would be worse to turn him into the forest, Colonel Gray said. How do I know he'll find his brother? Bayar is in a state of siege. It's a risk we must take. Besides, he's dead broke, except for his dirk knife. I could help with the horses I put in, earn my way. Mr. Murphy looked at me. I don't know how far I can get along the Camino Real, he said. May have to stop short of Bayard to keep from getting mixed up in the battle. Then where'd you be? I could walk, I told him, stubborn as a mule, civilly. I'm headed for Washington on the Brazos now, Mr. Murphy said. These folks in the stage are needed for the Texas Convention. Don't know where I'll have to turn back after that. If you'll let me go as far as you, I'll be holding to you, I said. I'll pay it back. You can trust me. Mr. Murphy shook his head. It was then Colonel Gray put his hand inside his big coat and took out his money purse. A patriot must not be stopped, he said. I will pay the boy's way as far as you go. All right, said Mr. Murphy. In that case, it's no business of mine. Thank you, sir, I said to Colonel Gray, and I handed him my knife. Keep your weapon by you, he told me. I'm afraid you may need it. It's all I've got but the rattlesnake rattles, I told him. They're not much. I took out my kerchief with the rattles knotted in one corner. I'll take them, he said. I know a boy who would be pleased to have them. An Indian woman brought us in mush and milk and we fell to. After breakfast was over, Mr. Murphy said, you Billy, go stand by the horses heads. Colonel Gray and the other gentleman got into the coach and I untied the team from the hitching rack and jumped on the front seat between Mr. Murphy and his partner, whose name was Oliver. We trotted off down the rutted road. The sun had come up bright and shining and it was a clear, cool winter morning. I felt good. A doe deer came out of the woods and stood there with her spotted fawn staring at the stage. I am on my way, I thought. How surprised Buck will be. Along toward the late afternoon, Mr. Murphy let me take the reins and I drove the team. Oliver taught me how to haw the horses and when we pulled up for the night, I took off the harness and led them to water. It was Indian country and we did not travel by night through there. The next day it warmed up and began raining again. When Oliver drove, I held his gun over my knees. It was a long rifle and he let me aim it. I took a shot at a crow flying over, but I didn't bring it down. The rain kept up all day and when we came to a river, it was in flood. It's too deep to ford, Mr. Murphy said. I'm afraid we'll have to wait for it to run down. I don't like to drive in this. It held us up a day. A war always brings on a rainy season, Colonel Gray complained. I never heard it to fail. He fretted at the long wait. He was due to meet General Houston in Washington on the Brazos as he was carrying letters for Mr. Stephen F. Austin. He didn't think much of Texas, but he held his tongue in front of me. He was a Virginia gentleman. The days went by until I lost track. We had an accident to the wheel of the coach that I helped Mr. Murphy to mend with what I had learned in Uncle Todd's blacksmith shop. But we halted some days for this. Then it blew up a bad storm with wind and lightning and thunder in the winter. What kind of country is this, Colonel Gray shouted. No sense to thunder in February. So it was February by that time. Colonel Gray got restless with the waiting and decided to leave the coach and go on horseback into Washington on the Brazos. He and his companion took off their baggage and set out to look for horses they could buy. I was sorry to see Colonel Gray go. He shook hands with me. Don't shoot until you see the whites of their eyes, Will, he told me. I won't, sir, I said to him. I hope our paths cross again, he said. I hope so too, I said. I won't forget what you did for me. 
Finally, the coach was ready to travel again and we bore on toward Bayar, with Murphy grumbling all the while and threatening to turn back. Whenever we came to a way station on the road, we heard wild tales of the Mexican army sweeping toward Bayar, and Murphy said he did not want to get mixed up in that. But he drove on and one late afternoon, we sighted the gray rooftops of Bayar. It looked quiet, but Murphy pushed back his hat and scratched his head. I doesn't go inside the walls, he said. I'm going to stay on the road. They might hold me. There was only one passenger now besides me. He was a peddler fellow, and he decided Bayar was no place for doing business. I'm going back to Nacogdoches, he said to Murphy. Well, bub, Murphy said to me, this is the end of the line. I climbed down off the high seat and said goodbye. I thank you for the trip, I said. You make a good hand, Will, said Murphy. Now, take good care of yourself. The coach wheeled and went back along the road we had come. I looked after it and then I took up my bundle and began to walk toward the town. It was a pretty place, not rough logs like Nacogdoches, but smooth walled adobe houses. And the spring had already started there. There was a little river and I followed along its banks, which were overhung with greening willows and poplar trees, whose leaves made a sound like water when the wind blew, simile, and some blue-eyed flowers. There was another feathery tree with yellow flowers on it. There were not many people about, and those I saw looked at me with curiosity. When I tried to speak to them, they shook their heads, not knowing the English language, or they answered me in Spanish, but I didn't understand. How will I ever find Buck? I asked myself, now that I'm here, I don't know where he is. I felt fear rising in my chest and then cutting off my breath. It began to grow dark, but I kept walking down the bank of the river. I had been walking for hours and I had not had much sleep on the stagecoach, so I was hungry and tired and my feet hurt. Suddenly I saw a pair of yellow eyes shining in the dark and I knew it was some animal. It looked like a bobcat and it scared me. I turned tail and ran toward one of the poplar trees, but such was my hurry that I stumped my toe and fell headlong on the rocky ground. I tore my trousers, skinned my shin, but I hardly felt it. I got to the tree, but it was too high for me to climb without a limb on its smooth trunk. So I went around behind it and shrank down on the ground, trying to make myself small. I lay there panting and scared, but the bobcat did not follow me. So I was afraid to move. While I huddled at the foot of the tree, sleep overcame me. I couldn't keep my eyes open. I don't know how long I lay there, but when I waked up, the stars were shining and I smelled meat cooking. I remembered how hungry I was. My stomach thought my throat was cut. That's personification. I stood up and looked around and a little way off to the right, I saw several fires burning in a clearing. I didn't know whether to go or stay, but hunger made me walk toward the smell of the meat. Soon I came on a bunch of horses tethered in the mesquite trees and I could hear the voices of men speaking in English. I began to run. I ran. I ran haphazardly over the rough ground and all at once I felt the cold nose of a rifle against my empty belly. The sentry towered over me in the dark. Who goes there? He demanded in a voice I would have known anywhere in the world. It's me, Buck, I shouted. Don't shoot, it's Will. <laughs> That's how I found my brother Buck in Bayar. Will, he hollered, what are you doing here? He leaned down close to me and I wish you could have seen his face. For a minute there, I thought he was gonna shoot me anyway. I had stumbled onto the bavouillac of Davy Crockett and his volunteers. A whole bunch of men, 15 or 16, were squatting or lying around on the ground talking and eating and in the big middle was Colonel Crockett singing about the lonesome wayfaring stranger. Every time he finished a verse, a howl went up and everyone clapped and shouted for more. The smell of the meat made my mouth water. Answer me, said Buck. What in the name of goodness are you doing here? I came to join the army. I said, I'm gonna fight for Texas. How many times do I have to tell you you're not old enough, Buck groaned. How did you get here? Came by the stage, I said proudly. Don't talk so loud, Buck said. I'll be in a pretty pickle. Colonel Crockett's ears had pricked up. 
He stopped singing and strolled to the edge of the circle of men. The beekeeper stood up and moved silently to the rim of the light. The talk stopped. What do you got out there, Buck? Colonel Crockett asked. I guess Buck didn't know what to say. Well, answer me, Colonel Crockett said. Is it a Spanish maiden? Still, Buck didn't answer. Is it an armadillo? No, sir, Buck said finally. Well, what is it then? It's me, I said, and I stepped into the firelight. I guess I made a sorry picture. My clothes were dirty from the mud and rain and traveling, and I had torn my trousers when I fell down, and my hair had gotten long and hung in my eyes. Colonel Crockett looked at me, and he began to laugh and slap his thigh, and then everybody laughed, and I could see Buck getting mad as an old wet hen. Similarly, look at this ringtail tutor. Colonel Crockett shouted. What am I going to do with him, Buck said. He followed me like a little yellow dog. First thing to do is give him his supper, Colonel Crockett said. Boys, this is Buck. Wait, boys, this is Buck's brother, Billy. They all laughed again. The beekeeper handed me a piece of meat. It was a young kid they had barbecued over the fire. I never tasted anything as good as that. Scared as I was of Buck's temper, my hunger got the best of me. I ate as fast as I could choke it down. So you came all the way from Nacogdoches? Colonel Crockett asked me. Yes, sir. I got a lucky chance on the stage. And he's going back on it, said Buck. I am not. I'm staying here. We look for trouble, Colonel Crockett said. Don't you reckon you ought to hightail it back to high ground? No, I don't, I said. I want to join the volunteers. He's not but 12 years old, Buck said. He can't take care of himself. Going on 13, I put in. He's come quite a way by himself, Colonel Crockett said, over rough country. I don't know how it happened, Colonel, Buck said. I ask your pardon. It's not a matter of that. I doubt the stage will return this way with the news being what it is. We have to figure this out here and now. The volunteers haven't got time to be nurse mammies. Buck said, real mad. They've got work to do. I don't need nursing, I said, real mad too. I can take care of myself. Can you shoot? Colonel Crockett asked me. Yes, I can, I said, if you can get me a gun. Can you handle a knife? Yes, sir, I said, and I drew my dirk. They all laughed again. I never saw people so ready to laugh. I was a wayfaring stranger myself when I was 12 years old, Colonel Crockett said. Maybe you're taking it too hard, Buck. Buck hung his head. I felt I had shamed him. If you say so, I'll take him on. I don't want anything to happen to him, Buck said, his eyes flashing. Why do you think I'm here? I want him to have his chance. I figure he'll take his chance, Colonel Crockett said. You promise to obey orders, Will? I do, I said. All in favor, say aye, Colonel Crockett said to the men. Opposed, no. A shout of aye went up. Buck said no in a mutter and turned his back. Colonel Crockett put his hand on Buck's shoulder. It's not a matter of yay or nay, he said. We've got no choice. We've got to take him with us. Tomorrow we march into the fort. You did your best. It's a compliment to you the way the men voted. I'm sorry, Buck said, and went on guard again. Indian, Colonel Crockett said to the dark man, in the morning, round me up an animal. I gotta have a mount for the new man. When the Indian left, Colonel Crockett looked at me again and said, looks like he'll need something in the way of a uniform. Where's your hat, boy? I lost it, I told him. It fell off the day the stage forded the river. Well, now, he said, Let's look around and see what I can find. He dug in his saddlebags and dragged out a coonskin hat with the tail hanging down just like his. It was worn down to the hide in patches and the tail looked as if something had been chewing on it, but I thought it was about the finest hat I had ever seen. Here, try it on, Davy Crockett said, and he set the cap on my head. It fell down around my ears and over my eyes. I couldn't see out. Everybody laughed again. Reckon we could take a tuck in it, Davy said. He took the cap off and punched a couple of holes in it and tied it with a leather thong. I put it back on. It does become you, Davy said, and slapped my back. You're a wayfaring stranger for sure now. I didn't have any place to look at myself, but I ran to the creek and I looked at my reflection. 
I felt my chest just swell. I never had expected to look like that. I was prouder of that hat than anything I ever had, except the dirt knife Buck had made me. I couldn't keep from swaggering around to feel the old coon tail hitting against the back of my neck. The men all gathered around me and began to josh me, but I stood them off. Pretty soon they gave me another piece of roasted meat and I sat down by one of the fires to warm. Colonel Crockett was telling a long story about when he was 12 years old and he was sent off with Mr. Siler to drive a herd in Tennessee and the big things he did. But before the story was finished, I went to sleep with my cap on and I never knew how it ended. In the night, somebody came and covered me up. It was Buck. He put a blanket over me and he lay down on the cold ground. I knew he wasn't really mad at me anymore.